Jesus is our life-giving water. And what we come to celebrate today is that indeed Jesus is the one who quenches our spiritual thirst. Certainly one of the predominant images in the season of Lent is that of a desert, that of dryness. In fact, we are marked with dust and ashes on Ash Wednesday to remind us that we will all one day return to the dust, to the earth, and that we need to be humble always in God's sight. And then as Lent begins, we travel with Jesus into the desert where he himself was tested and tempted and overcame the temptation that the devil offered him. And we are invited to enter that dry, arid desert, that landscape that gives us time and room to face our own temptations. Then we're led to the mountaintop for the transfiguration of the Lord, a sign of hope for us that we can continue on our journey because the vision of where we are going is clear in our mind's eye that we know we do these Lenten disciplines of prayer and fasting and giving alms because we know it's worth it, that there's glory for us at the end. And in order to step each day to the life of glory, to a life of transfiguration, we need to be people who practice service and sacrifice just as Jesus did. So we turn our attention from Matthew's Gospel, which are the Gospels we read at the beginning of the season of Lent this year, to John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel, this week and next and the week after, we will be presented with images of the nature of sin. And today, with the story that is oftentimes termed the woman at the well, we are confronted with the realistic view of sin, that sin has a personal effect in our lives. No matter how private our sin might be, it affects us personally, just as it affected that nameless woman at Jacob's well. It would be difficult without some understanding of the culture of Jesus to pick up on the clues that are presented to us in this gospel about how this woman was separated from her community. No one ever went to draw water at noontime in Palestine. People always got up very early, probably when the roosters began to crow, and if you've ever been around a rooster, you know that's even before the sun comes up. And they would go to the well, and they would gather water together, um, other women together helping each other get the water out of a deep well or cistern. And they would be home, because it was oftentimes quite a trip, they would be home by the time it was the heat of the day. But this woman couldn't go with the other women because she was separated from them, because each and every one in the town knew her sin. So when Jesus approached the well at noon after a long day's journey, he knew she was sitting there because she had no place else to go. She knew she was doing her morning chores in the heat of the day because probably she was being ostracized and ridiculed by the other women in the village. Jesus knew right off that she was probably a sinner, and everyone knew it. It's interesting that as the story unfolds and Jesus is talking about himself as being the life-giving water, this living water which is to be refreshing and moving in our lives, and he is the one that quenches our thirst. She keeps thinking about the literalness of what Jesus is saying, and Jesus keeps talking to her about her soul, about her spirit, that we need to continue to be nourished, our thirst quenched by something that is a spiritual reality, that Jesus himself is the life-giving water. And she keeps focusing on the water and the bucket 
how deep it is. How is he going to get it out? And if he gets it out, he, she wishes that she never had to come back there again. But as she experienced Jesus as the life-giving water, she began to understand. She began to understand what she needed to do. It's interesting that she left her water jar behind. She finally understood that he told her everything. That was the message that she went and proclaimed to the town. The town already knew anything, everything, everywhere. It's probably like living in Avon Lake. Everyone knows everything anyway. So they went and told the crowd that this man, Jesus, told me everything I ever did. And she was excited about it. How many of us would be excited about that? She was overjoyed that finally someone knew her. And in that encounter, she experienced Jesus as the life-giving water. It was her message that he told her everything she ever did that excited the townspeople so that they too came to experience this life-giving water. In our Lenten desert, when we are thirsty, do we look to Jesus to fill and quench our thirst, or do we continue to look elsewhere? And it's a question for us to consider on this third Sunday in our Lenten season. Where do we go to quench our thirst? And I'm not talking about the drinking fountain or a bottle of water or to the kitchen tap. Where do we go to quench our thirst? And Jesus tells us the only way to quench our spiritual thirst is through him who is the life-giving waters, who we encounter in baptism, who offers us the gift of eternal life. So may we continue to ponder, to question, to reveal in our own lives, what is the source of our spiritual thirst? Is it Jesus, or do we try to fill it with something else? A good question for us to ponder. She asked Jesus for a drink, and then Jesus gave her life-giving waters, waters that quench our spiritual thirst forever.